Good morning. So I, one of the things that Bob does for us is he makes those little videos for us, and we had no clue when we were getting him that that's one of those little skill sets that he was going to bring, and so I appreciate that. I love the, the one that, he's, that he just made for the next series that I'm going to be talking on. And by the way, I'm collaborating with his wife, Lisa, on the next series of messages. We're going to tag team, and I'm excited about that, but we're, we're going to be t looking at Romans chapter 12 and really digging into that. And that is such a great, great scripture. So I look forward to that. We've been talking about money matters. Now, if I was to give you $250, if I was just to hand you $250 and said, go, go down, let's go down to the outlet malls in Woodburn. And you have four hours to spend that $250. And at lunchtime, we're going to meet together and I'm going to buy you lunch. And let's see what you got. What would you buy? Would you go down to the, uh, the Gap or would you go into the Levi's store, into Tommy Hilfiger <laughs> and buy clothes for yourself or for your family? Would you go to one of the home goods store and buy some nice decorations and trinkets for the house? What would you spend that money on? Well, Ron Blue is a, was a famous, he, I mean, he's still, he's still kind of famous, but in the, in the last part of of the 20th century in the 1990s, he was like the go-to uh, Christian financial guru along with Larry Burkett and a couple others. Now it's Dave Ramsey, everything Dave Ramsey, but it was Ron Blue back then. And when his daughter was nine years old, he did something very similar. He, he said, okay, I have $25 for you. She was nine years old, so 25 was like a million dollars. Nine years old, and we're gonna go to the mall because they went to malls back then. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't shop online. And we're going to go into the mall and you have two hours. I'm going to walk with you around the mall for two hours and you can spend that $25 on anything you want. But I'm going to be your financial advisor. <laughs> How much fun would that be to have dad? <laughs> but she was only nine years old. Okay. But so they walked through the mall and she just fell in love. I mean, she, she, looked, she walked through the mall and probably went through a half a dozen stores, but within an hour... She spent her $25 on some little cute little pencils and some notepads. And she said, Daddy, I have to have these. These will change my world. Even though he was trying to remind her, what are you going to think about this tomorrow? How is this purchase going to impact you and influence you tomorrow? And she wouldn't have anything of it. She just said, Dad, that's what I want. Well, the next day... The glitz and the glamour wore off and she thought, maybe I can get dad to take me to the mall again and spend 25 more dollars. There's three truths that he tried to teach his little girl at that time. I want to just briefly introduce you to these three truths before we look at how we can, how we can um, put these into our lives as we make responsible choices with money. The first is this, that we all have limited resources. We do not have unlimited resources. There is, when you go to Costco, there are, there's literally millions at each Costco store, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars of product. And you have very few dollars that you can spend, but you have to make all these decisions about what you're going to pass by so that you can say yes to what you're going to purchase. The second thing is that today's decisions determine tomorrow's destiny. So if you spend a dollar today, Guess what? That dollar will never be available to you to spend in the future. And then thirdly, the longer term perspective that you have, the better your decision making. When we have money, whether it's a little or a lot, there is responsibility that is attached to it. And since there never seems to be enough money for us regular folk... <laughs> you and I have to be wise in the way we spend our money. We have to make good decisions. Now, King Solomon was a wealthy man. In fact, he grew up in wealth. He grew up as a prince. And so he had everything he needed that, since he was a boy. And he inherited everything that his dad, King David, had. And before he took the mantle of leadership on, God came to him and said, Solomon... What do you want? Ask anything of me and I will give it to you. And I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, 
If you don't, I'm going to put it up on the screen. But 1 King chapter 3. And this is the very beginning of King Solomon's reign as the king of Israel. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, ask what, ask, what should I give you? And Solomon replied, you have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on this throne as it is today. Lord, my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet, I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people you have chosen, a people too numerous to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an obedient heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, because you have requested this and did not ask for a long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, but you asked for discernment, also known as wisdom, for yourself, to understand justice. I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that there has never been anyone like you before and never will be again. In addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no man in any kingdom will be your equal during your entire life. If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands, just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Solomon asked God for wisdom. He says, I want wisdom so that I can make the right decisions with my responsibilities. And I want to make the right decisions on how to handle all the wealth that I have at my disposal. And God said, that is a great choice, young man. And so, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I am going to give you money beyond your wildest imagination. Now, fast forward to the next book in the Bible, 2 Kings. There was the Queen of Sheba who had heard about King Solomon. She had heard about all of his wealth. She had heard about his wisdom, and she wanted to meet this king. And so she traveled to Israel so that she could actually see for herself who this King Solomon was. And when she saw him, and when she observed him in action, she came to the conclusion that what she heard did not even do it justice. He was wiser and wealthier than what she had even heard. Solomon, in my own country, I had heard about your wisdom and all that you've done. But I didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. And there's so much I didn't hear about. You're wiser and richer than I was told. 2 Kings 10 verses 6 and 7. Now, by the time we get to verse 23 in that chapter, there's a little slight adjustment that the writer makes. He transposes the words riches and wisdom. And he says... He was the richest and the wisest king in the world. Now, why did he make that change? And I don't know exactly, but I wonder if it could be because sometimes money changes us. And that's what happened to Solomon. Lots of changes in his life. Wealth beyond measure came into his life. He had to make decision after decision after decision. I would not want to be president. I would not want to be a king. I would not even want to be a CEO of a mega corporation. I, decision after decision after decision. Solomon had it all. He was the richest man. I, it is estimated that he even dwarfed Jeff Bezos' money. That's how wealthy he was. But at the end of his life, he writes a book called Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes, he says this. He says, you know, I've had all the money in the world. I've had all the power in the world. 
I've had all the sex that a man could ever want. I've had money, sex, and power, and everything is meaningless. It doesn't mean a thing. Today is the last message. I'm sharing the last message in this series. Money matters. Balancing loyalties between God and money. And remember at the very beginning and all throughout this series, I've been quoting a scripture from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said right in the middle of it. It is impossible to serve God and money. You can't do it. It's not possible. You may think it's possible. It's not possible. You will either love the other one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Bible has a lot to say about money. We talked about that at the very beginning of the series. There's over 2,000 verses in the Bible that is, is directly uh, deals with money and our possessions. 16 of Jesus' 38 or so parables. So almost half of his parables have, have something to do with money and possessions and how we handle it. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Don, uh, John, one out of every t 10 verses is about money or how we handle money. The Bible has an awful lot to say about money. So the question as we end up this series is how do you make financial decisions? How do you make money decisions? And I want to talk about four principles for helping us to make healthy and responsible decisions about money because we have to know. So the first one is this. Commit your plans to God. By the way, the writer of Proverbs is mostly attributed to Solomon, the wisest man. God gave him wisdom. And the vast majority of the Proverbs that he wrote down are attributed to Solomon. A huge portion of the Psalms are attributed to David, but there are a number of Psalms that are attributed to to Solomon. He was known far and wide for his wisdom. And he wrote this in Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 3. He says, share your plans with the Lord and you will succeed. Now, there's two keys to this idea of planning. Um, in this, uh, two keys that we can, we can grab from this verse. The first one is planning. So he uses the word your plans. But he says also to commit to the Lord. In other words, share with the Lord. You know, we, we have this idea that we're in charge, that somehow we have to figure out everything out. The writer of Proverbs says this, or Solomon says this, we make our own plans, just uh, in 1690, he says, we make our own plans, but the Lord decides where we will go. We have this idea that we are in charge. But Solomon, remember, he says in Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, because God ultimately is in charge. I mean, we know that. I mean, we look at the cosmos, and I did a, I did a series of messages early this year, and we, we, we did some sort of diving in and sort of investigating God's creation. It was pretty amazing, the, the research and the things that I learned, and, and just, it's overwhelming. There's so much that I don't know, but, but we know that the stars that are in the sky aren't there by accident. They are placed exactly where they are by God's hand. By his creative hand. We know that if the earth was tilted on its axis just one half of one percent, either way, we would either burn up or we would freeze to death. God is a God of order and everything that we see in the cosmos is God's design in action. And so God, God is a planner and it is his expectation that we are planners. Someone said, I love this quote I came across, a budget is a theological document. It indicates who and what we worship. That's a good one. That's a one-liner for you, Bob. <laughs> Many of you, just to remind you, when I say that to Bob, it's because he's doing our online uh, chatting with the people that are watching us online, which, by the way, it's great that you're there. Love seeing you. Um, Without good advice, everything goes wrong. It takes careful planning. By the way, this is, a Solomon. this is Solomon. It takes careful planning for things to go right. We make a lot of plans, but the Lord will do what he has decided. Many of us plan our work. I mean, we do. If we're going to be successful at work, we're going to be planners. We're going to be organized. 
If we're going to be successful around our house, we're going to be planners. We're going to be organized. We can't just let the grass grow and I'll get to it one day. We have a strategy. We can't just assume that the house is going to magically wake up one day painted. We have to plan. We take care of our cars. We know that the cars will break down if we don't give attention to planning the care and the maintenance of our cars. But when it comes to our spending, oftentimes we just spend what comes in without thinking about planning. That's called consumptive spending. And what happens is that we spend the money that comes in and before you know it, we have less money. We, the money runs out before the, the month does. Planning makes you responsible. We're talking about how do we make, make wise and responsible decisions. Planning helps us do that. Again, Solomon says, any enterprise is built by wise planning becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Any enterprise, whether it's your home, whether it's your a business, anything, any enterprise that you're going to plan and invest in, invest your energy and your time in, will be successful because you've planned wisely. And so we're supposed to plan. Now in my It's Your Move bookmark that I will have for this message this week when I send it out, I'm going to talk about some planning. That's why it's so important for us. At a very young age, and if there's any young marrieds watching or young single people watching, it's very important for us to begin to plan for retirement. <laughs> Before you know it, you're going to be 58 years old. And you're only seven years away from retirement, so to speak. I'm not going to retire at 65, just so you know. The second principle is this. Commit yourself to giving God's portion. Again, the proverb, the writer of the Proverbs, it would be Solomon. Honor the Lord by giving him your money and the first part of all your crops. Then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. When you get home, um, if you still work for a living, you know, pull out your last paycheck stub. Now, if you're like most people, there will be a little box up at the top or a little line item up at the top that says withholding. Or it'll have the little initials FICA. And you'll look at that and you'll look at your paycheck and you'll look at that and you say, holy moly, how much money goes to government and fees. And when you look at that and you look at your net income, you're going, how in the world can I give God the first part of my income. Folks, if you would give God the first part of your income, you will honor God. And you know what he's promised? He will bless you. Now, a question that people have is how much is God's portion? The first part is called a tithe. And it represents 10% of all your income, money, and the first part of your crops. So 10% of all of your potential income. And that was the expectation that was taught to the, in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel. In Malachi chapter 3, which by the way is the last... Uh, book in the Old Testament. It's, he's a minor prophet because it's a small book, not because he's not important. But we get to the time, this leads into the silent years, that 400 years where there was no writing and no really what's God doing before the Messiah showed up on the scene. And God gave the people of Israel when they were pulled out of Egypt and given this wonderful land with milk and honey, he gave them a way to live their lives to honor God. And one of the things that he gave to them is this responsibility to give 10% of their income to God in what's called the storehouse. So that God's chosen people, all of them were God's chosen people, but there was a tribe that was given the responsibility to, to create the experience of worship. The children of Israel, their whole world had been Egypt. Their whole world, they'd been immersed in pagan ritual, the, the God of the Egyptians, child sacrifice, human sacrifice, 
worshiping idols, worshiping stone, worshiping things. And they were God's chosen people. They remember their history. They remember jo Joseph and how Joseph worshiped God in the midst of that pagan life, that pagan world. And God blessed him. But by the time they come out of Egypt, they had been suffering. But all they've known is this pagan world of worship of all these things. And God calls them out. And in the calling out, and as they walk through the desert, they begin to take on this personality of worshiping the one true God. And they had this tabernacle. It was amazing. But it was portable. Can you imagine packing up every day that tabernacle? It's not like your tent. Believe me, it's something amazing. But they had this tabernacle, and this was the place that the people would come, and they would worship Yahweh, a personal, loving, kind, and generous God who never wanted to have human sacrifice, ever. They brought their sacrifices of of their money and their first fruits, and that was allowed, that was brought so that the priests, Aaron and his sons, and, the, and then the future priests, they would, they would be able to live off, they would be taken care of. And then this, this, this sort of went along through their Old Testament history. That was the reason that they brought a tent, so that these men of God didn't have to worry about taking care of a farm or taking care of a ranch. And by the time Malachi comes along, the children of Israel had forgotten to do this. And so the priests, they started doing other things. And many of the things were not good, let me tell you. And the children of Israel forgot the one true God. And so Malachi reminds them, the reason you bring a tent is because it's a reminder that I am God and I'm to be worshipped. Now that New Testament tent is not required of us today. Jesus, so in, in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 and 10, it says, I am the Lord all-powerful and I never change. So like you come out of Egypt, I'm not a different God. 400 years before Jesus comes, I'm not a different God. He says, I challenge you to put me to the test. Bring the entire 10% into the storehouse so that there will be food in my house. Then I will open the windows of heaven and flood you with blessing after blessing. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. In the New Testament, the obligation for a tithe wasn't carried over. It, but Jesus supercharged it. He says, I not only want your money, he's speaking on God's behalf. I not only want your money and the first part of all that you own, I want all of you. I want all of you. We're supposed to give everything and all that we are to God because Jesus gave everything for us. Why is it this way? Money is directly related to our commitment to God. So a tithe, which seems like a pretty significant amount, I like to describe a tithe as giving generously with open hands. And what I mean by that is that so often, even in our giving, we are very possessive. That's why we designate funds a lot of times. Because we want to be in charge. God wants us to give generously with open hands. God, I'm giving it to you. And I entrust it to you. And we as a church, for example, entrust our stewards to be good managers of that open-handed gift that we give. And I will tell you, Sherwood Community Friends doesn't need your money. Glenn, if you're watching, I hope you don't have a heart attack. <laughs> Glenn's our, our treasure. We don't need your money. God wants you. And he wants all of you. 
What kind of commitment have you made? Have you given him everything? Have you actually demonstrated that he is the owner of everything that you have? And by the way, God doesn't want us to be tithers. Uh, uh, he, God doesn't want us to be tippers. He wants us to be tithers. Tither is giving generously with open hands. <laughs> Think about tipping. By the way, I had a conversation with my son-in-law. Uh, D- Dan, if you're watching, I'm going to tell a little story on you. My son-in-law, when I first met him, when he and Bethany were engaged, and then when he was first married, uh, he was in the restaurant industry. And so he's very, very aware of the lifestyle of people that live in that service industry. They get low wages, and they, they hope to augment those wages with their tips. And so I, being my age, I'm old school thinking, okay, 10 to 15%. And I was really being generous if I gave 15%. And that was only because the lady said, honey, you're dear to me. (laughs) Or the food was amazing. Only 15% if they're lucky. And Dan and I went round and around and around. He said, no, you got to give 20%. What? I only give God 10%. What? 20% because rich, with the wages they make, they need that extra money to actually live. Okay, so when Nadine and I go to a restaurant, we automatically plan to give 20%. Sometimes, sometimes when this service is exceptionally good, the food is amazing, they get a bigger tip. Never do I give less than 15%, even if the food wasn't that good, because of the conversation I had with my son-in-law. And yet... When we come to church, we think, how in the world can I give 10%? God doesn't want us to be tippers, folks. He wants us to give it all. And when you look at the story of the early church, Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4, this is the life and the times of the people of God coming out of the nation of Israel, the old covenant. The new covenant has started and the church, the church, they sell everything they have and they own things together and they take care of all the people's needs as they have need. They took that literally. The third thing that we need to do is commit to God's provision. If you've committed your plans to God, you've committed your portion to God, then you trust him and he won't fail you. I love this passage in 2 Chronicles. The Lord searches all the earth. I I have this I have this picture of God on a mountain with his with (laughs) with his binoculars. His his like super super binoculars. He's searching the whole earth whole earth around, looking for people who have given themselves completely to him. And then when he sees people that have given themselves to him, he is going to bless them. He's going to make them strong. Are you sold out? Money can be both a tool and a test. It's a a tool because it can help us. It's used to help people provide for our family and do things God calls us to do. But it's a test to see what we've learned in our relationship with God. Do we really? Remember Malachi said, God said, put me to the test. God wants us to depend on him and not on what we can get for ourselves. So how do you make financial decisions? What process do you go through um, when making a a decision on money? Let's just just pick something that I think you can appreciate. Uh, Nadine and I, um, last year we bought a brand new trailer and we couldn't find one for the life of us. And we found out why. It's because people, um, because of of, um, COVID, all this money they had in the bank to go to like Disney World, they couldn't go. And so they said, well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's spend money. Let's take this money and put, buy a trailer so we can go camping. So let's just, let's say you want to go to Disney World down in Florida. And you've got to buy tickets for the whole family, plane tickets. You've got to buy tickets for the, you got to buy tickets for the actual park. You've got a, a hotel reservations. You've got to get a rental car. Um, you've got to pay for the food. And then there's always incidentals. You've got to buy souvenirs. There's just stuff that comes along. And let's just say, 
I'm probably way low on this, but let's just say that your budget is $16,000. I know a lot of you are going, but that's probably what it'll cost for a mom and a dad and two kids to go to Disney World. And you have the $16,000 in the bank because you've applied some of these other lessons. You have the money. You deserve a break. I'm not going to let COVID keep me, keep me down. Now that we can go, we're going to go. What do you do? As you commit to God's provision, well, you probably pray. You know, I have, I have most of the money in the bank. I'm sure maybe $4,000. I could put that on the credit card. And in your prayers, you seek wisdom. Like Solomon, you seek wisdom. And then you wait for assurance, confidence that you can move forward. And so what happens is we, we have confidence that God is going to give us his provision. His provision may be in the answer that says, yes, go, go to Disney World with your family. But if we wait and we listen, God may say, no, it's not time. That's not how I want you to spend your money. And we, as if we're being good stewards, we're going to listen to that voice. The fourth thing is we need to commit to God's peace. And I think this is a, an important part of this. Um, God is a God of peace. I, I think of the one image I have is you see these hurricanes, it's hurricane season, and they, they have these massive, massive, you know, they show these massive cyclones on, on the map, you know, and you just go like, you're just thankful you live in the Northwest, right? Um, but right in the middle of those hurricanes, right in the middle of the tornadoes, it's peaceful. The noise isn't really, there's a big, huge roar, and it's peaceful. Now, we know that, it, you know, the, the hurricane passes by and it gets really loud and very dangerous. But... We live in a world that's very chaotic. It's like a hurricane. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in all the noise and all the tumult. But God is a God of peace. And he wants us to rest in that peace. And I believe if we follow through with some of these, these steps and we pray, am I going to spend money on that? Am I going to start giving a certain amount above and beyond what I was giving to God? I believe that God is going to give us peace. Even though we, we feel like our lives are tumultuous, we're, we're thinking, how in the world? I'm going to make this commitment, but I, honestly, as I look at my, my finances, I, I just don't know how it's going to happen. But as you wait for the Lord and He gives you clarity... He gives you the thumbs up. He's going to give you peace. And he's going to provide for you. And so often, we shortchange God. We circumvent God's plan because we don't wait for the peace. We forget to take the time to wait for the peace as we move out. And there's story after story after story after story after story in the Old Testament where that was the problem with the nation of Israel. Proverbs 10.22, again a proverb of Solomon. When the Lord blesses you with riches, he blesses you with your life. You happen to be, as Dave said, you happen to be a person of means or not. But when the Lord blesses you, you have nothing to regret. Those are the four principles. Commit your plans to God. Commit to give God's portion. Commit to give God's provision. Commit to God's peace when you make financial decisions. I believe that it's impossible to really experience peace, to really please God, unless you first give Him your heart. Oh, God wants all of you. He wants your finances. He wants your house. He wants your truck. He doesn't need it. He wants you. But he wants your heart. 
He wants you to come to a place where you say, I see what Jesus did for me because of the love that God has for me. I'm humbled by that. I'm amazed by that. I cannot believe that God would love me like that. I want to give him my heart. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't given Jesus your heart, God your heart, whether you're here in the room or online, that's the first step. You may be a financial guru. You may be rolling in the dough. But you may have a business plan that is going to take you to Mars. But it's meaningless in the words of Solomon if you don't have Jesus. And for those of us who are old timers in the faith, maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is the time that God is telling you it's time to give me your all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> it's really such a joy to call you Father. To know that we can come to you and have a personal and intimate relationship with you, Father. I pray that we would recognize that you are the owner of everything and we are just the managers, the honored managers, but we are just the managers. And we want to commit ourselves to your plan, to your way, to your principles of being responsible with what you put into our hands. Father, it's such a great privilege to, to handle money, to have money, to have possessions. But I, but I think we oftentimes make decisions that aren't very, aren't very good. And so we don't have a peace about our lives, whether it be finances or whatever. And I would pray that we would be a people that would get in line with your will on this matter. Everything we do, everything we do, we want to bring honor to you. We love you we love you and we commit ourselves to you this day in Jesus name Amen